Everything changed at the end of that period, the beginning of what we might call the modern period, especially with the age of discovery. In the 15th century, the Portuguese sailed down the west coast of Africa and found a multitude of black people, of course, who were living there in the various regions of Africa. They also discovered that there was a whole system of slavery already in place in that part of Africa. Local leaders, authorities, or rich people would buy and sell slaves as a matter of doing business. And so as the Portuguese began to acquire more inroads in the African continent and being able to uh, develop different areas, for instance, Angola in West Africa, they needed manpower. Now I say manpower because it was mainly men that they were looking for because they wanted people who would work. Women were considered not good workers enough to, for them to bother. But as a matter of fact, they enslaved both because they wanted a means of uh, continuing the propagation of slavery through reproduction. So that began uh, in the late 15th century. But the whole practice exploded when the Spanish discovery of America with Columbus, this would basically be the Caribbean, but of course we know that there were two big continents behind uh, the Caribbean there that eventually were uh, discovered and developed. And so with the supply of slave labor from West Africa provided by the Portuguese, and with the development of colonies in the Caribbean and the Americas, especially uh, the area we call Latin America from Mexico all the way down to Southern South America, you had uh, a fertile area for development of the system of slavery. Now, what was happening with Church men, and I say church men specifically because I'm talking about the clergy who are all men. What were church men doing at that time in terms of what we think of this abusive system called slavery? Basically, nobody was saying much at all because the church men themselves had slaves. And even the Pope, certain popes at time, had slaves. Slaves that were used as assets, wealth, slaves, slaves that were used in trade. So the clergy, churchmen, were involved in the functioning of the whole system. At first, the Spaniards tried to enslave the natives who lived in the Caribbean. And when they got to South America, they tried to do the same thing with the natives in places like Peru. But they soon found out that the, the native laborers either died too quickly, sometimes by disease, or sometimes it could just be resistance. They, they did not go along with the whole slave system. And maybe through what we would call um, passive aggression, they just quietly 
slow down their labor and tried to sabotage the Spanish work system. That idea of using native labor didn't work adequately for the Spaniards. And so like the Portuguese, they started importing black labor, especially from West Africa, to uh, work on the farms. So this was in the 16th century that, that it developed. However, from the very beginning, and, and this is really the point of the book that, you know, I translated, the manuscript I translated and put in the book, is to show that not everybody went along with this system. There was a whole network of people, few in number, but strong in voice, who consistently tried to tear the system down. The first person that we know of who publicly came out uh, against slavery was Antonio Montesinos. He gave a homily and attacked the institution of slavery. And he caused a ruckus as a result and got a lot of pushback from the people who had invested in the system and who were profiting from the system. But that became the first event of a, a consistent tradition of attacking slavery that lasted through the whole Spanish colonial period. Another Dominican, a man named Bartolome de las Casas, someone who had heard Antonio Montesinos' sermon and was struck by it, was also very prominent in the anti-slavery movement. As a layman, he had come over to the Caribbean on one of Columbus's voyages. He came back, settled in the Dominican Republic as a landowner and an owner of slaves, but indigenous slaves. And he had a change of heart because of what Montesino says and because of what he saw the practices were in the slavery system around him. Eventually, he became a Dominican. Was ordained and began to campaign against slavery itself. Now, De Las Casas was in a unique position, a prestigious position, because he had accompanied Columbus himself on one of the voyages, and he had been one of the earliest settlers in the New World. He had access to key people in the Spanish government. And he made use of that. So he went back to Spain and tried to get some of the laws changed. Talked to the people who controlled the government, government of the colonies and try to get legislation passed to protect the indigenous people 
from this institution of slavery. Eventually, he was made a bishop and made a bishop in uh, modern-day Mexico. And from there, he continued his work against uh, slavery and lobbying the, the Spanish court to pass legislation to change the practices of slavery. Now, just to show you the, the conflicted thinking of the time, with all of the uh, effort and uh, time and energy and influence that de las Casas had, his focus was on slavery of indigenous people. De las Casas did not really take up the cause of black slavery. In fact, earlier on in his life, he thought it was a good idea to import black slaves from West Africa so the indigenous people would not have to become slaves. There would be workers who were blacks who could take their place. Later on in life, he realized how wrong this was. And he actually even wrote I don't know if I ever will be forgiven for doing that. But De Las Casas has gone down in history as one of the main opponents of Spanish colonial slavery early on. He was a, a writer who published influential works, and uh, those works had an impact on the Spanish court. So he got the, the Spanish leaders, the king and his, his ministers, to um, at least mitigate some of the practices of slavery and uh, has legislation that at least tried to improve the condition of the slaves. However, the, the problem uh, was that uh, with, with all the, the arguments and the experience and lobbying efforts of De Las Casas, he was up against a, a, a major problem. The Spanish settlers needed manual labor, and they were determined to get it one way or the other. And so no matter what the Spanish king or court did, it was fairly easy for the Spanish settlers to simply ignore it. The local authorities, who in practice were in cahoots with the settlers, uh, simply ignored what Spain told them to do in a lot of cases. Now, there are many other examples of this, but uh, it, it it is important to realize that there's, there's this background, that the church from the very beginning and the churchmen who really had the influence in the church were conflicted in terms of how to deal with the slave system. It, it doesn't make any sense from a Christian point of view to have two classes of citizens or believers. One group who baptized, you know, are full Christians. Another group who are owned by the first group, baptized, but are not full Christians. And there was not any uh, success in trying to reconcile this inconsistency with uh, following uh, the teaching of Jesus. 